Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to take a look at a technique of integration that will be useful when you see products of trigonometric functions in your integral. Now, this is going to be more specific to products involving powers of sine and cosine, powers of tangent and secant, or maybe powers of cotangent and cosecant. Because they have a nice relationship, we know that the derivative of sine is cosine and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So there's some really nice substitutions that you might be able to find if you're creative with your strategies. Same thing with the relationship between tangent and secant. We know the derivative of tangent is secant squared, and the derivative of secant x is secant x tangent x. So there's a nice relationship between those two functions as well. If we have integrals involving combinations of powers of those pairs of functions then, what if we could just try to find a way to use some clever trigonometric identities and create a clever substitution. Well, let's start off with the first example here. Let's start off with powers of sine and cosine in our integral. Now remember, the goal here is to come up with a substitution, since there's a nice relationship between sine and cosine being involved in each other's derivatives. Ultimately, hopefully we can let u equal sine x, or we can let u equal cosine x, and that substitution will be working perfectly for us. But that's only gonna be the case when maybe sine of x or cosine of x has just a single factor. If we have multiple factors of sine x and multiple factors of cosine x, then the first trick here is to look and see whether or not the power of cosine is odd. If the power of cosine is odd, then we can actually write that power here, n, as equaling 2k plus 1, where k is an integer. Let's assume that it's non-negative. Any odd integer can be written in this form, since 2k would be a an even integer, and plus one, simply one more, would make us have an odd integer. If that's the case, then what we're going to do is we're going to split up the powers of cosine. We're going to leave a single cosine just kicking around so that we can make a substitution later. The remaining powers of cosine would be an even integer. And then we can use the identity of cosine squared x equal 1 minus sine squared x to turn the even powers of cosine into sines. If that's the case, our integral is going to only have powers of sine in it with a single factor of cosine, and we will use the substitution u equals sine. Now, of course, that's a long description. Let's see what it actually looks like in practice. If I have sine of x to the power m, and I have cosine of x to an odd power 2k plus 1, then I'll just leave that additional power of cosine remaining left over. It's important to leave that extra factor of cosine, because now I've got cosine squared x to a power k. This is going to be where I can use that little identity, 1 minus sine squared x. And you can see how everything is now in terms of sines, and I can replace those with u so that du, which is cosine x dx, is going to become a perfect substitution. Now, all of this is actually very, very similar in the scenario where the power of sine is odd. I would just have to save an extra factor of sine and convert the even powers of sines into cosines. We can see that this second strategy here is exactly the same. Here, I'm just letting m be an odd number, 2k plus 1, for some integer that's non-negative k splitting up the sine powers into an even number and a single additional sine, taking the even powers of sine and replacing them with the identity sine squared x equals 1 minus cosine squared x. And you can see that eventually I can rewrite this entire integrand in terms of cosine functions with just the additional factor of sine x that I've saved. Letting u equal cosine x then, you see that du is equal to negative sine x, so that sine x I've kicked around for this entire time will help us to make the substitution. If you happen to have the powers of sine and cosine both being odd, then we could just go back and treat this as case number one. As soon as you see an if-then statement, just as long as the first part of the statement is true, power of cosine is odd, then you should be able to follow the instructions. You could use either one of these strategies if both of them are odd, but it's better maybe just to stick with option number one. What's remaining here is the difficult process when the powers of sine and cosine are both even. If that's the case, we can't have this clever strategy of leaving a single power of cosine or a single power of sine. In those cases, 
we will actually have to use some additional identities, our half angle identities. We could take sine squared x, which is an even power, and replace that with one half of one minus cosine two x. Now that's an odd power, so that might be a little easier to work with. Cosine squared x can be replaced with one half one plus cosine two x, so that might be a little easier to work with. And you may even be able to see that if we have sine and cosine both to the same power, we might be actually able to apply this identity. Sine x times cosine x can be written as one half sine two x. And that will allow you to hopefully reduce powers to an easier problem. Now, these are just strategies. They're not gonna make a lot of sense until you see them in practice. So let's try a couple of these cases out and see what happens. In this first example, you see I have sine squared x, cosine cubed x. Well, the first thing really to look for is hopefully one of these has an odd power. If you see one of the trig functions, sine or cosine, have an odd power, then we're going to split that one up. We can write any odd power of cosine x as being an even power of cosine x multiplied by an additional cosine x. And we'll see how that actually does help us to make a substitution. And remember that this is a definite integral, so we're looking for a value in our final answer. Here is the next step of that process. We're going to keep this additional factor of cosine x right until we can make a substitution. The remaining even powers of cosine, we can use the identity. Cosine squared x equals 1 minus sine squared x. And here you can see I have an expression just involving powers of sine x, which makes sine x a very good substitution. If we let u equal sine x, then our dx can also be replaced easily. You can see that du is simply equal to cosine x dx. And that is going to take care of this additional factor of cosine x. This new integral is going to be u squared times 1 minus u squared du. But let's not forget that we do have boundaries 0 and pi over 2 that need to be updated to match this new variable. Our upper boundary, x equals pi over 2, needs to be plugged into u equals sine x. And that gives us u equals 1. And x equals 0, our bottom boundary, needs to be plugged into u equals sine x, and that gives us u equals 0. And remember, don't be too concerned if we find that these new boundaries actually go from a larger lower bound to a smaller upper bound. At this point in time, we can go ahead and distribute the u squared into the brackets and find the antiderivative. Now, it's at this point in time, for an indefinite integral, we would add the arbitrary constant of integration plus c, and then revert back to our initial variables. But as long as we've done this additional work of changing the limits of our integration, then we can go ahead and plug those 0 and 1 values into u directly. And that will give us 1 third minus 1 fifth, and then all of that minus 0, which gives us 2 fifteenths. Now, for the purposes of getting through a couple other examples here, let's just see if we can get each of these integrals to the point where we can make the substitution. That is really the key here of this video, is seeing what strategy needs to be put in place so that you can make the appropriate substitution. And from there, who knows? You may have to do integration by parts, you may have to do future substitutions, but the goal here is to get us away from just a terrible trigonometric integral by doing a substitution and hopefully getting us to just some sort of polynomial with powers of u. So we may not finish every example completely. I may leave it as an exercise for you to try on your own. In this example, I've got sine x to the power 5 and cosine x to the power 2. So let's just see if we can get this integral far enough that we can make an appropriate substitution. In this example, we're going to try to save an additional factor of sine x, since we have an odd power already. That sine x to the power 5 can be written as sine x to the power 4 times an additional sine x. Now, we're not quite ready to make that substitution just yet. We need to somehow try to get this entire first portion of our integral in terms of cosine functions. Well, sine x to the power 4 can be written as sine x squared, all squared. And at this point in time, we can use the same identity as before, but solving for sine squared x. And at this point in time, now we can do that substitution. We will choose to let u equal cosine x, and that gives us du equals negative sine x dx. Well, be careful here. I only have sine x dx. That negative sign means that sine x dx is actually equal to the negation of du. So when I make the substitution, 
I will end up with a negative sign in front of the integral of 1 minus u squared all squared times u squared du. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to try this out and find the final antiderivative. In this example, don't forget we're looking for the most general antiderivative, which is going to be an expression involving cosines here plus c. Now what we haven't seen just yet is when we have an integral involving even powers of sine and cosine. In this example, let's suppose we just have an even power of cosine. Well, there's no sine factors in there at all, but we can think about this sine x as being to a power of zero, which is still even. In this case, we'll have to apply one of our special identities. In this case, cosine squared of x is simply equal to one half of one plus cosine two x. And because of that identity for trigonometric functions, we do have an integral that can be solved by a more simple substitution. So in this case, we can let u equal 2x. Now be careful, that does mean that dx is going to equal du over 2. It may be useful to put our integrand in brackets, because when we substitute dx equals du over 2, that 1 half can be multiply by the constant multiple in front to get one quarter, and that's going to help us to get this final answer. I'll leave that change of variables, or u substitution, up to you, and see if you can come up with the answer. Now, as another special example, what if we were to have an even power of sine and even power of cosine again, only this time we have sine theta all squared and cosine theta all squared? Well, we might be able to use another identity this time because we do know that sine theta times cosine theta is one half of sine two theta. So our first step to rewriting this might be to write sine theta times cosine theta all squared, and then apply that identity. Now it's at this point in time that we can make a substitution, and that should help to get us back to a more familiar problem. Now that we've gotten our sines and cosines all combined together into sine squared u now, then, well, we might be able to see that this is very similar to our last example. And we'd have to just do one more of these half-angle identities to get us to our final solution. Now, you will notice in scenarios where you have to do substitutions more than once, we can't always let u equal some expression because we already have expressions involving u. You'll have to try to choose a new variable we haven't used yet. When we started our problem in theta, we ended up with a problem in u, now let's choose to change the variable to something new like v. And much like in our third example c here, from this point onward, we should end up with an integral in terms of a new letter, v, that is pretty straightforward to evaluate, and you can get this answer. Just don't forget to revert from v back to u, and then back to theta. Okay, well that gives you a pretty good idea of how to deal with sines and cosines. I mean, a lot of this is going back to substitution. The tricky part is applying the trigonometric identities so that we can get to a useful substitution. Now, it's at this point in time that we can move on we're to another relationship between trigonometric functions. We're fairly familiar with relationships between sine and cosine, but we also know that there's a neat relationship between tangent and secant. So let's take a look at integrals involving powers of those pairs of functions, tangent and secant. Let's suppose that we are starting off with a problem involving an integral with tangent x to the power m and secant x to the power n. Well, we're going to be trying to set up a substitution just like with sines and cosines. And if we choose u to equal tangent x, then du is equal to secant squared x dx. And that means we should make sure that we have secant squared x be somewhere. And there is a Pythagorean identity between tangent and secant. So let's start off with the case where the power of secant is even. Okay, so an even number is simply just two times an integer. So let's write n equals 2k. We're going to assume k is non-negative. If that's the case, we're going to want to make sure that we have an extra factor of secant squared x kicking around. Because we're going to make the substitution u equals tangent x. We better make sure that the power of secant is even for this to work because we'll need all of the remaining powers to be even so that we can use the identity secant x squared is equal to 1 plus tangent x squared. Our substitution will be u equals tangent x. So let's see what that will look like in general. 
In general here, we just wrote that power of secant as being an even number, 2k, then we can actually take that 2k and write that as a secant square that we'll save, and that will reduce the power by 2, leaving us with an even power secant squared x to the power k minus 1. And that secant squared x can be replaced with 1 plus tangent x squared with this identity. If this is a little bit confusing, just remember if I have secant x to an even power and I want to split that up, I'm going to have to reduce the power by 2 and I'll have an additional secant squared x. And this was still an even number. You can see that 2 is a factor of 2k minus 2. That means I can write this as secant squared x to the power k minus 1. And that's where we get this idea from. Secant x all squared is just the same thing as 1 plus tangent x squared, and then we can go ahead and make a little substitution, u equals tangent. Okay, so another scenario where we can come up with a strategy of using identities to come up with a substitution is when the power of tangent is odd. Here, if the power of tangent is odd, and remember odd numbers can be written as 2k plus 1, again for some non-negative k here, what we're going to do is we're going to actually save a factor of tangent. Well, if we pull one away, that leaves us with an even number of tangent factors. And we're going to make sure that we also leave one factor of secant kicking around. If that is the case, then all of the remaining even powers of tangent can be substituted with the identity tangent squared x equals secant squared x minus 1. And we'll be using the substitution u equals secant x because the derivative of u equals secant x du would equal secant x tangent x, which is what we've saved around to make that substitution. And here's what that would look like in general. We have an odd power of tangent x. If we pull one away, that leaves us with an even power of tangent, 2k. Well, we can write that as tangent squared all to some power k and replace tangent squared x with secant squared x minus 1 and then make that substitution. Let's try an example and let's again, let's see if we can just get as far as figuring out how we get a substitution in order to evaluate the integral. Now you can see here I have two examples, each of those scenarios being covered. In one example, I have an even power of secant, and in my other example, I have an odd power of tangent. So let's just see what kind of strategy we need to use in order to get to our u substitution. And I'll leave it up to you to finish each of these examples off. In the first example, I have secant to the power of 4. So I'll split that up so that I save a power of secant squared. Now, I've got this set up to do a substitution u equals tangent. You can see that here because I've got the derivative of tangent ready to go. Secant squared x dx is going to be perfect if I let u equal to tangent x. The only thing I have to remain to do here is take the other factors of secant x and convert those into powers of tangent by using the Pythagorean identity. And that will allow me to use my substitution. Once I do my substitution, secant squared x dx is going to be replaced with du, and I'll have a nice polynomial in terms of u. Fairly straightforward to integrate from that point onward. In this other example, I have a definite integral with an odd power of tangent. So what I have to do in this case is I actually need to split up both the powers of tangent and secant so that I have secant x tangent x dx at the end of my integral. Now that might look like a fairly strange way of rewriting these factors, but it is conveniently done so that I can let u equal secant x at some point in time and have the derivative du equal to secant x tangent x dx. The only thing I have to remain to do is to change the powers of tangent into secant. And it's at this point in time that we can complete the substitution. And this will give us a nice integral in terms of u. Now, don't forget to also change the limit of integration here. Both of these become very simple problems that are both just polynomials. You can go ahead and expand both of these out and then find antiderivatives using power rules. Now, of course, there are going to be other scenarios that you may encounter. For instance, what happens if the power of secant is odd and the power of tangent is even? All right, well, good luck. Some of those are going to be a little bit trickier. Sometimes you actually have to do some pretty bizarre manipulations of the integrand just so that you can come up with a good substitution. A lot of it, though, is 
going to be focused on trying to rewrite the integral until you can get that substitution. But what about cosecant and cotangent? Well, they're very, very similar to secant and tangent. So that relationship between cosecant and cotangent just essentially apply the same rules as the relationships between secant and tangent. Just keep that process in mind. Save some factors to the end so that you can make the appropriate substitution. I'll let you figure those out because they're very, very similar to secants and tangents. And there you go. That gives you a pretty good overview of the typical strategies for integrals involving powers of sine and cosine and integrals involving powers of secant and tangent. Now these are going to be coming up in other techniques as well because we're going to find out that some just algebraic expressions are actually quite difficult to integrate, especially when you have things like the square root of 1 plus x squared or 1 minus x squared in your integrand and the substitution you want to do doesn't seem to work. You actually have to do kind of a process of taking an algebraic expression making a trigonometric substitution so that you can get to a trigonometric integral so that you can use these strategies. Like I say, integrals can sometimes take far more steps than derivatives, but we'll save that for the future. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.